The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 8. Facing Hard Facts Middle East analysts and authors A.J. Abraham and George M. Haddad have stated the Islamic view very clearly. Islam is God's plan for the world, every inch of it, not only the Islamic regions. Islam is for everyone, whether one wants it or not. It is the duty of every Muslim to help expand the borders of Islam until every being on this planet acknowledges that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. No honest Muslim would deny this. Omar Bakri Muhammad, belatedly banned from England since he fled to Lebanon in early August 2005, has long claimed to be bin Laden's man in Britain, which makes it all the more puzzling why he was so long allowed to openly preach in London and elsewhere hatred of the West and an Islamic takeover of the world. International political intrigue is a tangled rat's nest of double-dealing. John Loftus claims that Harun Rashid Aswat, who has been linked to Omar Bakri, suspected mastermind of the July 7, 2005 London bombings, was once recruited by British intelligence to fight in Kosovo in defense of Muslims' rights. Our sins come back to haunt us. Iraq and Afghanistan are both examples of that fact. The Muslim riots that traumatized France in November 2005 were her Islam is peace chickens coming home to roost. While still in London, Bakri declared, The aim of the Khilafah, that is, Caliphate, the ideal Islamic state, which does not presently exist, is to conquer the world. There can be no end to jihad until the Muslims conquer the White House. Compromisers call Bakri an extremist. In fact, he represents true Islam, which is gaining strength. Nothing less can be justified by the Quran, by Muhammad's words and deeds as recorded in the Hadith, and by the history of Islam as practiced consistently by Muhammad's immediate successors and through the centuries that followed. Although Egypt has a secular government, Islam is nevertheless strong and presents a perpetual problem for Egypt's rulers, even though they are Muslims, at least in name. Egypt's Western ways are criticized by those who believe that the only way to dress, eat, and behave is the way Muhammad and his followers did in the 7th century, and as the Taliban enforced when it was in power in Afghanistan. The power of Islam, even in this secular state, is evident in the fact that Cairo is the location of the Al-Azhar University recognized as the authoritative center of Islamic thought and theology for the entire Muslim world. Muslims insist, apparently in all sincerity, that the only true freedom comes through submission to Islam. How could they honestly believe that? Could it merely be a semantic problem that centers upon differing interpretations of the meaning of words? Or must the difference in thinking go deeper? In the previous chapter, we noted that on December 10, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations at its third session after coming into existence on October 24, 1945. There were 56 members at that time and 54 present. The vote for the declaration as a whole was 48 in favor, including, surprisingly, a number of Muslim countries, Afghanistan, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, and Turkey, with eight abstentions. Those abstaining were the Soviet bloc of nations, USSR, Belarus, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Ukraine, and Yugoslavia. Saudi Arabia, and South Africa. This declaration remains one of the most important ever adopted by the UN. 
Article 1 of the Charter, upon which the UN was founded, declares that one of the principal purposes of the United Nations is to achieve international cooperation in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. In the process of composing the entire declaration, votes were cast by the members for and against each proposed article. Of particular interest is the fact that Article 18 was adopted by all 56 members. It reads, Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. What did you say? Although it abstained from voting for or against the declaration as a whole, Saudi Arabia, along with every other member state, approved Article 18. Even the Soviet Union and China agreed to abide by Article 18, although any child living in either of those countries knew that these freedoms were no more permitted there than under Islam. Saudi Arabia was pledging to the world that every person in that country would have the right to change his religion or belief, and, in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief. Yet, as we have seen, Saudi Arabia beheads any Muslim who changes from Islam to any other belief. No non-Islamic religion may be practiced, and these Islamic laws came into being by decree of Muhammad himself and are therefore unchangeable. Could the contradiction between Islam and Article 18 be any more plain? How can the undeniable differences between what Saudi Arabia professes to the world and what it does in practice be explained? Of course, the same question could be asked not only of other Muslim countries, but of communist countries as well. We would rather not believe that they are deliberately lying. Then what is the explanation? The Bible provides the uncomfortable answer. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. Quoting Isaiah 29:13, Christ rebuked the rabbis of his day with these words, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. It is a common human failing to profess one thing with the lips while denying it in practice. Those who call themselves Christians are as prone to such hypocrisy as anyone else. The Bible declares that the hearts of all people are the same. But some cultures encourage the natural evil and dishonesty of the heart. Such was the situation in the pagan Arab culture from which Islam sprang and which it is still deeply rooted. It is one thing for an individual Christian to profess to love Christ and his neighbor as himself and yet to fail to live up to this in daily life. It is something else altogether, however, for one's religion itself to teach its followers to lie, commit violence, plunder, and murder in order to advance its cause in the world. As we have seen, this is the case with Islam, and the hypocritical denial of that fact is practiced daily throughout the Muslim world and in its dealings with the West. And Western leaders seem content to accept and even encourage this deadly deception. A Policy Based Upon Deceit 
How long can we continue to ignore the past and present persecution and slaughter of Jews and Christians by Muslims worldwide and to persist in defining Islam as peace? As one historian states, 13 centuries of religious discrimination causing suffering and death of countless millions have been covered by the myth of Islamic tolerance. The West overlooks, as though non-existent, the outright denial of basic human rights and support of terrorism by Saudi Arabia and other Muslim countries, and, incredibly, favors and sometimes even arms Islamic terrorists, as in Afghanistan, Chechnya, Cyprus, Bosnia, Kashmir, Kosovo, Macedonia, Sudan, and East Timor. Repeatedly, Israel has been taken to task for overreacting to suicide bombings, for pursuing terrorists into PA territory, and for destroying the houses from which terrorists have operated. How could someone who acts in self-defense to save himself from assailants who are intent upon murdering him possibly be accused of overreacting? America and Britain and their few allies in Iraq and Afghanistan are finally learning what Israel has faced alone and under heavy criticism for the past 50 years. It is a shocking discovery to finally realize that we are confronted by an enemy that is eager to kill or be killed in order either to conquer the world for Allah or be martyred in that battle and thus hopefully gain the paradise promised by his religion. The world court has condemned Israel for building a fence and a wall. This barrier is not like the Berlin Wall designed to keep the oppressed from escaping communism's paradise. This one is erected in self-defense to keep out terrorists intent upon murdering Israelis. It has, in fact, reduced the death rate in those areas where it has been completed. But without sympathy for the murder victims, the U.N. and E.U. censure Israel for defending herself while never expressing any disapproval of the murderers who attack her. Why this double standard? We have quoted statements from many Muslim leaders declaring in the clearest language possible that Israel must be annihilated and that they intend to do it no matter what the cost in human lives on both sides. Typical of hundreds of such threats was this statement by Farouk Kadumi, head of the PLO political department at the time. Quote, this Zionist ghetto of Israel must be destroyed. End quote. It couldn't be said any more brazenly because he knew, as Muslims today are confident is still the case, that no matter what murderous intent they bluntly declare and effect against Israel, Western leaders will continue to pressure Israelis as though they are the aggressors. If Israel made such threats against those who are determined to destroy her, Muslims would go berserk, and the UN, EU, and United States would condemn her soundly. Has the world gone completely mad? The Iron Curtain was rightly condemned by the non-communist world. Stiff pressure in the form of world opinion and various sanctions was laid upon the Soviet Union. That pressure eventually brought down the wall and helped to bring about at least some of the desired changes. Yet the United States, UN, and EU remain silent concerning the Islamic curtain, even though it is more vicious and impenetrable than the iron or bamboo curtains ever were. Even during the most oppressive times under Stalin and Mao, at least a few churches were allowed to remain open. In today's China, there are many officially sanctioned Christian churches, in addition to those that meet in secret, as well as other places of worship for Buddhists, Muslims, and those of other faiths. But in Saudi Arabia, not one non-Muslim place of worship is tolerated. 
in other Muslim countries where, under secular governments, Sharia is not officially practiced, churches are nevertheless being destroyed and Christians killed by Muslims because this is what Islam requires. Is it not time for the West to bring serious pressure to bear upon Saudi Arabia and other Islamic countries for their violations of human rights professed by U.N. members, just as it did with the Soviet Union and continues to do with China? How can the United States be a party to the hypocrisy of the United Nations professing to stand for human rights while its own members flaunt their violations with impunity? How can we ignore any longer the hundreds of millions of Muslims held in bondage behind the Islamic curtain without raising an anguish cry of protest in their defense? Although the EU, UN, and Western powers have been slow to put public pressure on Muslim countries, there has been behind-the-scenes arm-twisting, especially by the United States during the Bush administration. Through greater understanding and boldness on the part of some in the Western media to report the truth, such as Mortimer B. Zuckerman, editor-in-chief of U.S. News & World Report, the pressure of public opinion is beginning to have its effect. Saudi Arabia, for example, will make all possible efforts to improve its international image, higher education minister Dr. Khaled Al-Ankari said in Riyadh, October 2, 2004. Much of the effort will be deceptive public relations. Nevertheless, the Saudis are feeling the heat of what Ankari defensively called strident media campaigns to tarnish the kingdom's international image and discredit its values and institutions since the September 11 events. The Saudis are attempting to cover up the truth, as Ankari's speech revealed. Quote, we will work with our friends in the world to highlight the true picture of Saudi Arabia, the Qibla of Islam and Muslims, and the heart of the Arab world. End quote. He said the higher education ministry was contacting educational agencies and institutions in other countries to correct the distorted picture of Saudi Arabia. Obviously, their intent is not real change, but to polish their false image, which hasn't been distorted at all, except by the Saudis themselves in covering up the shocking truth of what Islam really is. In trying to protect what it calls its true image, Saudi Arabia will have to face frank criticism. A four-day forum, the second annual communication forum titled The Image of Saudi Arabia in the World, was held in early October 2004, involving more than 100 prominent personalities from within and without Saudi Arabia. The Saudis will have to make real changes. Hopefully, the scholars they have called in for help from around the world will not be satisfied with smoke and mirrors. Remember, this is Islam. Most of today's Muslims, whatever their origin, including Saudi Arabia, have forgotten, if they ever knew, that their ancestors were unwillingly forced into Islam under threat of death. This is Islam as it was at the beginning, always has been whenever possible, and still is. If Western religious and political leaders do not awaken from their delusion and stop mouthing the lie that Islam is peace, it will soon be too late to defend our freedoms. In the early centuries of Islam, its forces nearly conquered Europe. Had they not been turned back at Tours, France, and at Vienna, Austria, we might all be speaking Arabic today. Such aggression was not a mistaken zeal or a holy resolve applicable only to the past. It is the very heart of Islam, as Muhammad and his immediate successors taught and practiced it, and as it remains. The conquest of the world is demanded by Islam as its unchangeable goal.
Foundational to Islam is the declaration Muhammad made. Allah has commanded me to fight against all people until all people confess that Allah is the true God and Muhammad is his prophet. Islam divides the entire world into Dar al-Islam, the house of peace, and Dar al-Harb, the house of war, and demands perpetual jihad everywhere against Dar al-Harb, that is, non-Muslims. There can never be peace until Islam has subjected the entire world to Allah. Everywhere, with the complicity of those who are cooperating in their own eventual subjugation, Islam marches on. Terrorists are playing out their special role in that conquest. Unquestionably, Islam is behind most terrorism. Yet, the spread of Islam's mosques is allowed throughout the Western world and accelerates even while Islam denies the same liberty for other religions in territories it controls. Most mosques are funded by Saudi Arabia with oil profits from money we pay at the pump. Many mosques in the West are centers for terrorist cells and training, an indisputable fact consistent with Islam, thoroughly documented in the video Jihad in America. In July 2002, a RAND Corporation analyst told the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board that Saudi Arabia was an enemy of the United States, that Saudis were active at every level of the terror chain. Clearly, Saudi Arabia exports two products, oil and religious fanaticism. Dor Gold, former Israeli ambassador to the U.N., documents the uncomfortable truth about Saudi Arabia in his excellent book that everyone in the West ought to read. There is no explaining away today's suicide bombers and terrorists as extremists. In Muslim countries, terrorists are treated with the same hero worship that matadors receive in Spain and that NFL and NBA stars receive in America. Their faces appear on posters everywhere with accolades of praise and admiration. A New and More Subtle Jihad In A.D. 732, in perhaps the most important battle in European history, Charles Martel at Tours, France, defeated an invading Muslim army of several hundred thousand jihad warriors, killing their commander, Abd el-Rahman. That was nearly 1,300 years ago, and now, through another and more successful invasion, Islam has become the second largest religion in France, with about 6 million Muslims and 1,500 mosques. Jean-Louis Bruguiere, France's top anti-terror judge, recently said, The terrorist threat today is more powerful than it was before September 11. Rabbi Osman El Sayed Ahmed, known as Mohammed the Egyptian, alleged mastermind behind the Madrid train bombing in 2004 that killed 191 and injured 1,400, is an example of this new generation of jihadi operatives who apparently operate independently of the old Al Qaeda network an example of the next generation of Islamist terrorists that Europe must now contend with. The major international threat is still al-Qaeda, but in a new and even more deadly version. A new breed of recruits is swelling its ranks worldwide, no longer exclusively from Muslim countries in the Middle East, but angry, homegrown young men who hate the Western countries in which they have lived since their parents immigrated there. As Fox News recently reported, with its founding fathers in hiding and dozens of key operatives under watch, Al-Qaeda has changed and is taking advantage of people who don't have to cross borders, receive cash from abroad, or engage in other international transactions that might alert authorities. We are now dealing with many little Al-Qaeda's with the potential of neighborhood Al-Qaeda's, said Brian Jenkins, senior advisor to the president of the RAND Corporation. 
They may not be able to carry out specialized operations, but they can still operate at a lethal level. The diffuse nature of the shape-shifting Al-Qaeda is one reason it's hard to fight. Security services may crack one cell, but find little connecting it to others. Police in Britain have failed so far to charge anyone in the July 7 attacks on three subway trains and a bus that killed 52, and four suicide bombers, an attack authorities said bore Al-Qaeda hallmarks. Part of the goal is simply to keep going and keep launching attacks, thereby winning more recruits and money to the cause of creating Islam-led countries. The new Al-Qaeda is finding fertile ground for recruits among the children of Europe's immigrants. Their families left for a better life, but they really have not been able to fully integrate with the recipient societies. An eye-opening documentary aired on PBS in late January 2005 explained it might come as a surprise to many Americans, but the most pressing threat to the United States is not the suspected al-Qaeda cells at home, but rather the cells operating overseas, especially in Western Europe. Home to an estimated 18 million Muslims, Western Europe has become the new and deadly battleground in the war on terror. In England, more Muslims meet in mosques each week than Christians in churches. Islam is not capable of launching a military frontal assault against Europe, as in the distant past, but it is accomplishing more than earlier jihad warriors ever did by the peaceful invasion of immigrants under the cover of successful propaganda about its benevolent intentions. Sir David Vaness, Assistant Commissioner for Specialist Operations with London's Metropolitan Police, recently said... This country has seen terrorism since the end of the 1960s, both domestic and international terrorism here on the streets of London. What is different about this form of terrorism is the unequivocal intention to cause mass murder without warning in any form to the public. The new terrorists hide inside the mosques and Muslim communities. European police have thwarted dozens of Islamist terrorist plots set to be launched following the U.S. attacks of September 11. Rita Sayam, an Egyptian-born German citizen who reportedly had been under investigation in connection with the Bali bombings, has said any observer can see that this war in Iraq has created a school to train graduates on acts of terrorism and fighting. It revives the spirit of jihad in the Muslim nation. Areas in England, Germany, and elsewhere in Europe already have concentrations of Muslims that are able to vote in their own local candidates. By 2009, the three largest cities in the Netherlands will have a Muslim majority. Yet Europe has been unwilling to acknowledge the threat of Islam in its midst. Incredibly, even after the Muslim riots that ravaged France in November 2005, the lie that Islam is a benevolent, peaceful religion continues to be promoted by French national leaders. An impassable barrier? It is nearly impossible for Muslims to be integrated into society as other immigrants have been because Islam does not allow any distinction between religion and the state. Islam must rule not only in the mosque, but in daily life and commerce, in the legal system, courts, and government. Thus, for genuine democracy to be established in Afghanistan, Iraq, and PLO territory would be the death of Islam. Muslim countries will do all they can to prevent this disaster for their religion. Furthermore, even in the secular Islamic countries, such as Egypt and Pakistan, the Islamists rule to a large extent. In contrast, Western civilization follows the clear distinction Jesus made between church and state when he said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. 
Matthew 22, 21, and Luke 20, 25. This fundamental difference in political philosophy, recognizing that Muslims will attempt to use lawful democratic means in order to establish Sharia, must be confronted if the West is to survive the internal threat posed by the flood of immigrants. Omar Ahmad of CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations, has bluntly said, Islam isn't in America to be equal to any faith but to become dominant. The Quran should be the highest authority in America, and Islam the only accepted religion on earth. Texans used to cry, remember the Alamo. Jews still remind themselves, remember the Holocaust, never again. So Westerners had better repeat to one another in earnest, remember the conquest of India, the bloodiest story in history. Remember the slaughter of a million Armenians. Remember what Islam has done for centuries and is still doing in Sudan, Indonesia, Nigeria, and elsewhere. Remember New York, Washington, D.C., Madrid, London, and Paris. Don't let it happen again. Instead, many leading Christians promote peaceful opposition to terrorism as though terrorists would be persuaded by kindness. The liberal Christian allegedly evangelical organization Sojourners placed a full-page ad in a national newspaper that naively assumed that violence could be stopped by nonviolence. By implication, blame for terrorism that operates by force was placed upon Israel and the United States for opposing it with force. Particular blame was placed upon Christian leaders who encouraged the president to pursue terrorists. The ad critically quoted Jerry Falwell, quote, But you've got to kill the terrorists before the killing stops, and I'm for the president to chase them all over the world. If it takes 10 years, blow them all away in the name of the Lord, end quote. Although most Christians would be uncomfortable with Falwell's rhetoric, the ad denouncing him made no criticism of the terrorist, much less of Islam's promotion of murder in the name of Allah. We have documented Islam's role. As Israel's former ambassador to the UN succinctly declared, Without an unshakable conviction in the merits of martyrdom and in its rewards in the afterlife, terrorists would never have undertaken the suicidal attacks of the past decade. Such teaching comes from Islam alone. No other religion even comes close to promoting murder and mayhem, much less offers heavenly reward for such despicable evil. Islam itself is the root of the terrorist problem that plagues the world. Western leaders must begin there if we are to win the war against terror. But that is almost impossible, given the climate of tolerant acceptance of virtually everything in America and reluctance to truthfully criticize anyone or anything. On August 22, 2005, following protests by CARE for a July 25th broadcast, conservative radio host Michael Graham was fired from his daily three-hour talk show in Washington on WMAL-AM because he refused to apologize for truthfully saying, quote, We are at war with a terrorist organization named Islam, end quote. CARE Executive Director Nihat Awad accused Graham of using hate-filled words and praised WMAL's action as a step toward removing some of the harmful anti-Muslim rhetoric that fill our nation's airwaves. Hate-filled words? They are the trademark of Islam, but they amazingly are transformed into peace in Western minds when Muslims speak them. And never forget that Muslim vows to exterminate Israel, destroy America, and take over the entire world are not mere rhetoric. Terrorism is Islam's path to peace. 
To bring peace, Allah commands, I shall cast terror into the hearts of the infidels, strike off their heads, slay the idolaters wherever you find them. O prophet, struggle with the unbelievers and hypocrites, and be thou harsh with them. Believers, make war on the infidels that dwell around you. More than 100 other verses in the Quran advocate fighting to bring Islam's peace to the world. Remember, Muhammad's dying words were, May Allah curse the Christians and Jews. Muhammad Atta, Egyptian leader of the 9-11 terrorist, attended a mosque in Hamburg, Germany, where the imam preached that Christians and Jews should have their throats slit. Try to imagine a Christian minister preaching that from his pulpit. Wake up, West. The same violence is preached in many other mosques worldwide. This is genuine Islam, according to Muhammad and the Quran, in spite of denials by Muslim propagandists such as Care. Throughout its history, as we have documented, Islam unquestionably has been responsible for the slaughter of many millions of innocent victims, including Muslims themselves by rival factions. Islam doesn't bring peace, even among its most devoted followers. In the last chapter, we made brief mention of the eight-year war between Iran and Iraq, both Muslim countries. They used 1,000 tons of poison gas on one another. Many thousands of young boys were sacrificed to clear minefields for the troops following them and were deceived into doing so by Islam's promise of paradise with unnumbered dark-eyed virgins for those who die in jihad. We have seen the slaughter of Muslim citizens by Muslim rulers, such as the murder of thousands by Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Muslim leaders of Iran and Syria have committed similar atrocities against their citizens. The destruction and rape of Kuwait a Muslim country, by Iraq, another Muslim country, shocked the world. While Arafat and the Palestinians were cheering Saddam as a great hero because he was raining Scud missiles on Israel. In 12 years of civil war in Algeria, Muslims have killed more than 100,000 of their fellows. So it has been since the beginning, wherever Muslims were in power. The vast Al-Qaeda terrorist network began in the early 1990s. It was composed of a loose amalgam of groups in Algeria, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, who sought to overthrow their respective governments for not being true to fundamentalist Islam. Unsuccessful in this enterprise, they turned their attention to America, seen as the evil Satan representing a democratic and stabilizing presence in the Middle East, and worst of all, the supporter of Israel. Arafat and the PLO Dangerous as Al-Qaeda is, it ranks far below Arafat's Islamic PLO networks, which today, in spite of his death, still hold the record for the largest number of hostages taken at one time, 300. The largest number of people shot at an airport. The largest ransom collected, $5 million paid by Lufthansa. The greatest number and variety of targets, 40 civilian passenger aircraft, 5 passenger ships, 30 embassies or diplomatic missions, plus innumerable fuel depots and factories, plus assassinations by the thousands, and so on. Jordan had given these fellow Muslims shelter. But their heinous crimes against his people and Arafat's attempt to take over the country became so unbearable that King Hussein I finally turned his Bedouin troops on them and, with the help of the Israelis, drove them out of his country and into Lebanon. There the PLO, all devout Muslims, sincerely believing they were acting in the name of and to the greater glory of Allah and in obedience to the Quran, created an unequal legacy of torture and death, 
killing tens of thousands and leaving about 100,000 young girls pregnant when the PLO was driven out. Often the bodies of PLO victims, some of them small children, were mutilated and dismembered. Lebanon became a huge base for terrorist attacks against Israel, with the PLO's increased weaponry and the blessing of Syria. Life for Israelis became intolerable in Galilee, where there were constant massive artillery and mortar attacks launched by the PLO from within Lebanon. Thousands of residents either fled their homes or were forced to spend much time in bomb shelters. Israeli airstrikes and commando raids failed to stop or even lessen the PLO attacks, forcing Israel to take more decisive action. As former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said, No sovereign state can tolerate indefinitely the buildup along its borders of a military force dedicated to its destruction and implementing its objectives by periodic shellings and raids. On June 6, 1982, under the direction of then Defense Minister Ariel Sharon, Israel invaded Lebanon, determined to drive the PLO out of that country, as King Hussein I had driven them out of Jordan. There was a further reason, to remove huge hidden caches of arms known to be stashed in Lebanon, enough to equip a million-man army, much of it too sophisticated for the PLO to operate. It was obviously intended for a planned major Soviet invasion of Israel. Thousands of truckloads were required to haul it all into Israel. As the battle raged and the Israelis tightened the noose, the PLO retreated toward Beirut. Arafat's men would take people off the street, strap them into hospital beds, command the nurses to drain every drop of blood for transfusions for their wounded, and stack the dead bodies like cordwood in the halls. Sharon would have destroyed the PLO murderers and killed Arafat, but President Reagan insisted that the worst terrorist of our day be allowed to leave Lebanon alive. Arafat was given shelter in Tunisia, where he set up PLO headquarters in Bor Sidria. He was still directing worldwide terrorist operations from Tunisia when, incredibly, Israel took Arafat on as its partner for peace and recognized the PLO as the official representative of the Palestinian people. He was allowed to leave Tunisia and set up his new headquarters in Ramallah in the West Bank, where he received a hero's welcome. Instead of being tried by an international tribunal and treated like the Nazi, Serbian, Taliban, and Iraqi leadership as justice would require, Arafat was given the status of a highly honored world statesman. His bloody exploits gained for him international acceptance as a leader for peace and the Nobel Peace Prize. The United Nations, European Union, and countless world political and religious leaders sided with Arafat in his unjust demands and terrorism against Israel. And every indication is that his equally terrorist successors will receive the same favoritism. Arafat was treated at a French military hospital during his last days. And after his death, French President Jacques Chirac eulogized him as a man of courage and conviction. Tunisia has named a major avenue in Arafat's honor. Arafat was cheered by the United Nations General Assembly, received at the Clinton White House and Camp David, was received warmly at least ten times by Pope John Paul II, and the Pope visited him in his palace in PLO-occupied Israel and supported Arafat's opposition to Israel. In spite of murdering 11 members of Israel's team at the 1972 Munich Olympics, for which Libya's Gaddafi awarded Arafat $5 million, the PLO was invited to send its own team to the Olympic Games.
In 1973, the PLO was granted observer status in the United Nations. And in 1974, Yasser Arafat was invited to address the U.N. General Assembly, where he received a standing ovation, though he called for Israel's destruction. At the 2004 Olympics in Greece, the Palestinians received the most applause as all of the teams made their entrance. The West rewarded Arafat's terrorism. He became proof that terrorism and related riots can pay big dividends. Training the Next Generation for Peace That every Jew on earth must be killed and the entire world subjected to Islam to the glory of Allah is not an obscure teaching. One does not have to search in dark corners of a library to find it. This ambition is taught in today's textbooks in Islamic schools worldwide, including, for example, the Muslim Academy outside Washington, D.C. It is devoutly preached in mosques, presented as the heroic ideal to youth, and blared forth on radio and TV and over loudspeakers in the streets. Textbooks in Syria today lead pupils to the inevitable conclusion that all Jews must be annihilated. The Egyptian textbook, Studies in Theology, Traditions, and Morals, explains that the Koran encourages the faithful to perform jihad and behead the infidels. The beheading of hostages in Iraq simply marks the terrorists as Muslims who are following the example of Muhammad and the teachings of the Koran and the Hadith. And yet, Islam continues successfully to sell itself to the world as a religion of peace. This fact remains one of the mysteries of our day. There ought to be an international cry of outrage raised against Islam. This volume is not the first or only one by any means to sound the alarm in an attempt to awaken the world to the awful truth. Perhaps readers will be moved to demand the truth from Western leaders. That is the only hope for the West's survival. Captured documents have revealed that at the graduation ceremonies for the Hamas Islamic Society's network of kindergartens funded by Saudi Arabia, Palestinian children enacted the attacks of suicide bombers. Children wore military uniforms and mock explosive belts wielded imitation Kalashnikov rifles, and burned the Israeli flag. Palestinian TV carries a children's program modeled after Sesame Street, called The Children's Club. It features children singing songs about wanting to become suicide bombers against Israel. Sheikh Ikramah Sabri appointed Mufti, the highest Islamic authority of Jerusalem, by Arafat, told the Egyptian weekly Al-Aram Al-Arabi, The younger the martyr, the greater and the more I respect him. A new generation will carry on the mission with determination. What a tragedy! Could the innocence of such children ever be restored? Can that generation ever be convinced of what a normal conscience knows for sure, that the true God would never condone murder, much less give murderers a special reward in paradise? If so, millions of lives might be saved. Former PLO terrorist Walid Shobat writes, I was born and raised in Beit Sahur, Bethlehem, in the West Bank. Hatred of Jews was my education, what I was taught each day by teachers and parents and the entire community. I knew nothing else, so I believed it was the righteous thing to grow up and kill Jews. My lullabies and many of the poems we memorized were about flying body parts and rolling heads. I was initiated into Yasser Arafat's Fatah terror group and recruited by a well-known bomb maker named Mahmoud al-Mugrabi from Jerusalem. My life was turned upside down when I discovered that everything I had been taught about the Jews was a lie.
To die as a martyr in jihad was always the only sure way, maybe, to paradise for the Muslim. However, committing suicide in the process was never considered honorable until fairly recently. Perhaps as a result of having been tempted to kill himself a number of times, Muhammad condemned suicide. He reportedly said, whoever kills himself in any way in this world will be tormented with it on the day of resurrection. If Muhammad's condemnation of suicide as part of jihad could be widely communicated, it might turn the Islamic world against this practice. However, most imams justify suicide bombings as jihad martyrdom operations and claim that suicide in such instances is justified and rewarded. Hatred for Israel and the determination to destroy her is a prominent theme in publications officially distributed by ministries of education in Muslim lands. For example, in Jordan, a book used in the first year of high school declares, Israel was born to die. Prove it. A book for the second year in junior high in Damascus declares, the Jews are vile, greedy enemies of mankind. In Syria, a fifth grade book boasts, we shall expel all Jews from all Arab countries. In Egypt, a textbook for the first year of junior high urges students the Arabs do not cease to act for the extermination of Israel. A ninth grade textbook declares, Israel shall not live if the Arabs stand fast in their hatred. Even if all the human race and the devil in hell conspire to aid her, she shall not exist. One finds this underlying and perpetual hatred for Jews and the accompanying resolve to annihilate them in the writings of Muslim fundamentalists everywhere. In his testimony before the Senate subcommittee referred to earlier, David A. Harris pointed out that Saudi Arabian school books, even grammar books, are full of phrases exalting war, jihad, and martyrdom. And though all forms of terror are rejected by the Saudi Arabian school books, it appears that such prohibitions do not apply to cases that fall in the categories of jihad and martyrdom, especially against Jews. Harris elaborated further in a newsletter. Saudi school books are a hate-filled portrait of a bizarre and fictitious world a place where the protocols of the learned elders of Zion is a history text, where Israel does not exist on a map, where organizations such as the Freemasons, the Lions, and Rotary Clubs are bound together in a global Zionist conspiracy. The textbooks are not the product of renegade religious fanatics. They are official publications of the Saudi Education Ministry, the work of a monarchy that passes itself off as a moderate regime and American ally. Recently, we joined with the Center for Monitoring the Impact of Peace to conduct an investigation into Saudi school books. What we found was, to put it plainly, chilling. Practically every lesson, from grammar to geography to history, was bent and twisted to transform it into a vehicle for teaching hate. You will hardly find any sedition without the Jews having a part in it, one schoolbook says, blaming Jews for World War I and the French and Russian revolutions. Students are challenged to fill in this blank. Those who have incurred Allah's wrath are blank. You will not be surprised to learn the correct answer, the Jews. Nor is bigotry aimed at Jews alone. Saudi textbooks teach youth to despise all that is Western as well. Our work on this report was instrumental in the introduction of a resolution in the U.S. House and Senate, condemning the bigotry in Saudi textbooks, calling on the Saudi monarchy to change its curricula and expressing extreme disappointment with the slow pace of education reform. An Important Distinction 
This is not to criticize fundamentalism or fundamentalists. Every person who stands firmly upon his convictions is a fundamentalist. All Christians ought to be fundamentalists. That simply means teaching and practicing the fundamentals of the faith as set forth in the Bible and as taught and exemplified by Jesus Christ. All Muslims, too, ought to be fundamentalist. The problem is that the fundamentals set forth in the Quran and as taught and exemplified by Muhammad involve force, violence, and murder in order to spread Islam. But a true Christian is called to spread his faith by love, by charitable example, and by appealing to reason helping people face the fact that the penalty for sin was paid in full by Jesus Christ on the cross, and salvation is offered as a free gift to whosoever will. There is a vast distinction between Islamic and Christian fundamentals, a distinction that any honest person ought to recognize. Everyone is free to make up his own religion if he so desires, but no one is free to make up a religion and call it Islam, because that religion is already established with its founder, scriptures, traditions, and lengthy history of the example set by Muhammad and devout Muslims. So it is with those who make up their own religion and then call it Christianity and claim to be Christians. They have no right to do so. Christianity, like Islam, has its founder, scriptures, and lengthy history of those who practiced it biblically. It is deceitful for anyone to call himself a Christian who does not follow the teachings and example of Jesus Christ. Just as it is deceitful for anyone to call himself a Muslim who does not follow the teachings of the Quran and the example of Muhammad as recorded in the Hadith. That much is axiomatic. No one can excuse Islamic violence and murder by saying that the same thing, though on a much smaller scale, was practiced by the Crusaders. Though they waved crosses and obeyed the Roman Catholic Church and her popes in doing so, their slaughter of Jews and Muslims was in violation of the teachings of the Bible and of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ proving that they were not Christians. But what the Muslims did in slaughtering millions and spreading Islam from France to China, and what terrorists do today, is in obedience to the Quran and the life and teachings of Muhammad. Thus, they demonstrate that they are true Muslims, those who claim that Islam is peace and that they are not in favor of violence and spreading Islam, have no right to call themselves Muslims, and they are deceiving Westerners when they make that claim. Facing the Awful Truth Every child in the Palestinian Authority schools reads the textbook, Our Country, Palestine. Its title page declares, There is no alternative to destroying Israel. What a bald-faced deception, then, for the Palestinian Authority to pretend it wants peace with Israel, and at the same time to teach its citizens that Israel must be destroyed. And yet, the West encourages this fraud, pressuring Israel to make peace. Bosnian Muslim leader Elijah Izetbegovic declared there can be no peace or coexistence between the Islamic faith and non-Islamic societies. Could he have explained Islam more plainly? And doesn't that statement include the entire non-Muslim world? How can anyone who denies this basic Islamic teaching honestly call himself a Muslim? And isn't it dishonest in view of such foundational Islamic teaching for Islamic diplomats from Saudi Arabia or elsewhere to pretend otherwise? Islam has created a culture of hatred and murder that has devalued human life. On March 22, 2004, 11-year-old Abdullah Koran was stopped at an IDF checkpoint outside Nablus. 
when soldiers opened his school bag, they found inside, along with his Spider-Man doll, a 10-kilo bomb that his dispatcher, who was obviously following and watching him from a distance, not having told the boy he was blessing him with a free ride to paradise, had rigged to be detonated by cell phone. As the sappers worked to disarm the bomb, the cell phone trigger was dialed. Only a technical failure saved the lives of the boy and many around him. In this case, Abdullah, his name means servant of Allah, did not know his true mission. He said he had been offered a lot of money to take a package into Israel. Speaking at the United Nations on September 23, 2003, President Bush said that the Palestinian Arab cause is being betrayed by leaders who cling to power, but are feeding old hatreds and destroying the goodwill of others. The reprehensible necessity of being politically correct prevents Bush from stating the truth, that not only certain of today's leaders, but Islam itself is the direct cause of Palestinian hatred of Israel and of the West and provides the motivation for terrorism and suicide attacks worldwide. Morton A. Klein, national president of the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA, stated that truth clearly. In fact, the central obstacle to peace between Israel and the Palestinian Arabs is the fact that a culture of anti-Jewish hatred and violence envelops the entire Palestinian Arab society including its educational system, summer camps, its media, and the Palestinian Authority's cabinet ministers and parliament members. And that culture is created by Islam. What's wrong with multiculturalism? It has become popular in the United States public school system to downplay any uniqueness or benefit of the American way of life established by those who founded and built this country. Students are being taught that the values America has stood for over the centuries, rather than something to be cultivated and preserved, are something to be embarrassed about and actually to be despised. It has come to the point that almost anything from the East is preferred over anything from the West. This delusion began in the 50s and 60s with the hippie and drug movements that found our youth traveling to the East for enlightenment at ashrams of urine-drinking yogis and hashish-smoking spiritual masters. The more bizarre the behavior, the more superior it was deemed to be and the more followers it attracted. This brought an invasion of Eastern gurus to the West and resulted in the New Age movement, where anything is okay except saying that something isn't okay. To celebrate the new broad-mindedness, public schools, especially universities, began to glorify anything African or native, no matter from where. White skin was out and color was in. White was ugly and wicked. Black was beautiful and could do no wrong. Business and commerce which had built our civilization were damned for destroying the earth. Environmentalism, no matter how extreme and destructive in its own peculiar way, was the new darling. It is in this context that Islam and Muslims have gained an admiration that they do not deserve. In an article titled, Cultures Aren't Equal, Michael Barone shared some wisdom. Anyone who has been keeping up with British opinion since the July 7 bombings will have noticed that multiculturalism is under sharp attack. Multiculturalism preaches that society should be not a melting pot, but, in the phrase of former New York Mayor David Dinkins, a gorgeous mosaic. That mosaic, of course, looked less gorgeous as people surveyed the work of the British-born and raised bombers. In the past, Tony Blair has spoken favorably about multiculturalism, but on July 7, he struck a different note. 
Quote, it is important, however, that the terrorists realize that our determination to defend our values and our way of life is greater than their determination to cause the death and destruction of innocent people and impose their extremism on the world. End of quote. Sadly, the multiculturalist policies of Blair's labor government and its conservative predecessors gave refuge to preachers of Islamist hate in what some have called Londonistan. Now the Blair government has moved to expel Muslim clerics who preach hatred and terrorism, and the left-wing guardian fired a writer who was a member of Hizb Atarir a radical group that advocates a clash of civilizations and urges Muslims to kill Jews. The Dutch novelist Leon de Winter wrote that as traditional Calvinist discipline frayed and Muslim immigrants rejected Dutch tolerance, the delicate mechanism of Holland's traditional tolerant society gradually lost its balance. In The Age, Melbourne, Australia newspaper, Pamela Bone wrote, Perhaps it is time to say, you are welcome, but this is the way it is here. The Age's Tony Parkinson quoted the French writer Jean-Francois Ravel's Cold War comment, A civilization that feels guilty for everything it is and does will lack the energy and conviction to defend itself. Tolerating intolerance, good-hearted people are beginning to see, does not necessarily produce tolerance in turn. Multiculturalism is based on the lie that all cultures are morally equal. But all cultures are not equal in respecting representative government, guaranteed liberties, and the rule of law. In America, as in Britain, multiculturalism has become the fashion in large swaths of our society. So the Founding Fathers are presented only as slaveholders. World War II is limited to the internment of Japanese Americans and the bombing of Hiroshima. Slavery is identified with America, though it has existed in many societies. And the anti-slavery movement arose first among English-speaking evangelical Christians. Multiculturalist intellectuals do not think our kind of society is worth defending. But millions here and increasing numbers in Britain and other countries know better. Obviously, Nazism created a culture in Germany of which most Germans are now ashamed and that they would like to forget. Yet, after more than 60 years, as noted in Chapter 2, Hitler's Mein Kampf is still a bestseller in Muslim countries. Egyptian columnist Ahmad Rajab wrote, Thanks to Hitler, blessed memory, who on behalf of the Palestinians revenged in advance against the most vile criminals on the face of the earth. But we do have a complaint against him. His revenge was not enough. The Palestinian Peace Prize for Culture was awarded to Abu Daud for his book telling how he planned and carried out the murder of 11 Israeli athletes in the 1972 Munich Olympics. Imagine a self-confessed mass murderer in the West, instead of being imprisoned or executed for his crime, boasting of it in a best-selling book, for which he is honored with a special prize. Are Islamic Values Changing Western Culture? Islam destroys the essential sense of right and wrong that God has implanted in every human conscience, so that murder is rewarded with paradise, and murderers are lauded as the most highly honored heroes. This is the atmosphere Islam has created, and which not a few fanatics, but the average follower of Islam is immersed from earliest childhood. Muslims in the West may attempt to be aloof from such evil, but in the long run, they cannot be. Is it not time for them to admit the truth about the religion to which they still cling in denial of its established teachings and many centuries of violent history? But even Western governments have rewarded terrorists. The rewards heaped on Arafat are not the only example. 
Arrested by the French police in 1977, Daoud was released from custody for fear of PLO reprisals against France, a weakness that reaped a harvest of riots all the way into November 2005. If we continue out of fear to give in to terrorist demands, we have surrendered our moral sense of right and wrong and have lost the war. When I present the undeniable truth about Islam to audiences around the world, I see reactions ranging from discomfort to outright disbelief, and even accusations that I am lying. It is extremely painful for a normal person to acknowledge that a religion in our day literally calls for the extermination of an entire people and the subjugation of the world by force. Islam itself is Israel's chief and most determined enemy, and it is the enemy of Muslims too, as well as of all non-Muslims. Though many Muslims living in the West do not reflect the passion of world dominion in the cause of Allah, which is their duty, and may not even be aware of this aspect of Islam, they would soon learn the awful truth if they resettled in a Muslim country. Instead of enjoying their former Western freedoms, they would have to conform to real Islam. Why is there such a migration of Muslims to the West? Obviously, they prefer living in freedom under a democracy to living under the totalitarian regimes in Muslim countries. Speaking frankly with rare courage and calling upon Muslims living in the United States to face the awful truth of what Islam does to a country, Dr. M. A. Mukhtadar Khan, Director of International Studies, Adrian College, Michigan, put it succinctly, quote, It is time that we Muslims acknowledge that the freedoms we enjoy in the U.S. are more desirable to us than superficial solidarity with the Muslim world. If you disagree, then prove it by packing your bags and going to whichever Muslim country you identify with. End quote. He is among a growing number of scholarly Muslims who are raising their voices against terrorism by Muslims in the name of Allah. Of course, in doing so, they are criticizing Muhammad himself. A Wake-Up Call The Western world prides itself on freedom, democracy, and liberality. There is no better proof of the genuineness of this boast than the openness, generosity, and opportunities with which it greets immigrants, and especially Muslims, that the latter are particularly favored above all others, including Christians, apparently reflects the fact that Muslims control most of the world's oil deposits, and the West is afraid to offend them. They are allowed to build their mosques by the thousands, to have special prayer rooms in public places, such as schools and airports. They are given equal freedom to become citizens and to express their opinions, desires, and complaints with their votes in elections and in every form offered in an open and free society that practices the human rights denied in Muslim countries. Freedom of conscience, of speech, of the press— and of religion. Nor do we deny that such freedoms ought to be granted equally to all without regard to race or religion. But there is no justification for suppressing and even denying the truth about Islam's aggressiveness unto the death of all who oppose it. As a result, tens of thousands of deluded Westerners have converted to Islam, which they have been assured is peace and its influence is steadily increasing, so that both political parties in the United States wooed Muslims in the 2004 elections. In stark and shameful contrast, no such freedoms are offered in Muslim countries to non-Muslims, and generally not even to Muslims themselves. Yet, no voice is raised at the UN in objection, nor do Western political leaders speak out. Israel, the only real democracy in the Middle East, is criticized for every misstep. 
Yet the Muslim world, in virtual slavery to a religion that threatens with death any who dare question, much less oppose it, is never criticized for its continual denial of basic human rights. This is not pleasing to God, and it is only one of the sins for which His judgment will shortly punish the nations of this world. The West has stood up for civil rights in the face of communism, bringing pressure upon Russia and China that has borne fruit. On what basis can it any longer be justified that Muslim countries are in a class of their own? Untouchables when it comes to basic human rights? Continuing to give Muslims in the West freedoms denied in Muslim countries supports a gross unfairness that encourages the perpetuation of a double standard that denies everything the West holds dear. It can only lead to the discovery one day that we have gone so far along this shameful one-way road supported by the so-called Roadmap to Peace, leading to the destruction of the rights we advocate that there is no turning back. Would it not be best, instead of deluding ourselves further, to insist right now upon a just and fair equality with Muslims? an equality without which no lasting peace can ever be established among free peoples. Rather than continuing to promote the grossest of inequities that can only lead ultimately to a loss of basic liberties, should not the same pressures that brought down the Iron Curtain be applied to Muslim countries to bring down the even more vicious and impenetrable Islamic Curtain? An honest look at the demographics is all it takes to realize how deeply we are sinking into what could become a hopeless situation, unless the truth is faced now. Pat Buchanan has predicted that, quote, Europe will be inundated by an Islamic Arab African invasion, and Africa is fast becoming a Muslim continent. The Islamic invasions of Spain and France in the 8th century and of the Balkans and Central Europe from the 14th to the 17th centuries will be reenacted in the lifetime of most of those now living. Islam has already surpassed Catholicism as the largest religion on earth. Islamic populations are exploding. By 2025, Palestinians will outnumber Israel's Jewish population Two to one. End of quote. What should the West do? The World Islamic Front for Jihad against the Jews and the Crusaders over the signatures of Osama bin Laden and various leaders of militant Islamic groups in Egypt, Pakistan, and Bangladesh declared the United States has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of its territories, Arabia, and using its bases there to fight against the neighboring Islamic people. To kill Americans and their allies, both civil and military, is an individual duty of every Muslim who is able. By Allah's leave, we call on every Muslim to obey Allah's command to kill the Americans and plunder their possessions wherever he finds them and whenever he can. This infamous organization was co-founded by bin Laden and his personal physician, Dr. Ayman Zawahiri, in February 1998. Zawahiri comes from one of the most aristocratic families in Egypt. He and bin Laden met in Afghanistan in 1987 and have been partners in terrorism ever since. Zawahiri is, in fact, the mastermind behind al-Qaeda. He has declared his willingness on Al Jazeera television to die in jihad for Allah. Yet, he's doing all he can to avoid that fate. None of the leaders who exhort to martyrdom practice what they preach. The honor of dying is left to others. Zawahiri is a talented physician. He was raised among the wealthy in a luxurious villa in Cairo. Like most terrorists, he proves the lie that poverty among the Muslim masses drives them in desperation to desire to die in jihad. None of the 19 September 11 hijackers were from a deprived background. Islam itself is the catalyst for terrorism. 
as journalist Stephen Schwartz has pointed out concerning 15 of the 19 September 11 hijackers, quote, these were not poor people from refugee camps on the West Bank or in Gaza. These were not people who had grown up feeling some grievance against Israel and the United States because they lived in difficult conditions. These were not people from the crowded and disrupted communities of Egypt or Pakistan or people who had experienced anti-Islamic violence in the last 20 years and had therefore turned against the United States. These people had grown up in the country that Americans often think of as our most solid and dependable ally in the Arab world, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Al-Qaeda is essentially a Saudi political movement. Twenty-five percent of those detained in Guantanamo are Saudis. End of quote. A long overdue awakening in Western Europe? Nor are the many acts of terrorism occurring in Europe the work of poverty-stricken men who have sneaked in from downtrodden parts of the Muslim world. These are devoted Muslims who are, for the most part, well-educated, have lived in the West for years, have enjoyed its freedoms and opportunities, and yet have carefully plotted its destruction to the glory of Allah. Only recently have there been signs that Europeans are slowly awakening to the truth and preparing to fight back. It is high time. In Holland, the shooting and stabbing to death on November 2, 2004 of Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh in revenge for his having made a documentary showing the abuse of women under Islam has aroused angry reactions. Geert Wilders, one of the most popular politicians in the Netherlands, has warned that the country's democracy is under threat and has called for a five-year halt to non-Western immigration. The man arrested for Van Gogh's murder is a 26-year-old Muslim activist who holds both Dutch and Moroccan passports. Wielder's own life has been threatened many times for speaking out about the danger that Islam poses to his country and to all of Europe. The latest threat broadcast on the Internet in Dutch with a background of Arabic music, condemns Wilders for insulting Islam and offers the reward of paradise for his beheading. Citing a recent report by Dutch intelligence that recruitment for jihad is taking place in as many as 20 mosques in the Netherlands, with a sense of urgency, Wilders declares, quote, if in a mosque there is recruitment for jihad, it is not a house of prayer. It's a house of war and should be closed down. It's imams or preachers arrested and deported. Without swift, bold action, Islamic fundamentalism will topple the country's democratic system. The Netherlands has been too tolerant toward intolerant people for too long. We should not import a retarded political Islamic society to our country. Closing borders isn't enough. Newcomers should be forced to integrate. If we don't do anything, we will lose the country that we have known for centuries. This is something that I get angry about and I am going to fight for, to keep the country Dutch. End of quote. In Belgium, in mid-November 2004, authorities arrested a suspect accused of sending death threats to a senator of Moroccan heritage who criticized radical Muslims. In a meeting on November 19, 2004, European Union Justice and Interior Ministers agreed that immigrants to the 25-nation bloc should be required to learn local languages and to adhere to general European values that will guide them toward better integration. EU Justice and Home Affairs Commissioner Franco Frattini told reporters in Rome that integration had to be an essential part of an EU policy. Pointing to the fact that 500,000 Turkish and Moroccan immigrants in the Netherlands don't speak Dutch, Immigration Minister Rita Verdonk declared, If you want to live in the Netherlands, you have to adhere to our rules and learn our language. 
This is a good start for Europe. America has failed to take such steps, but the awakening will have to go much further than blaming terrorism on extremists. Even Wilder still imagines that the problem is radical Muslims, those who have begun to speak out and call for action against the growing terrorism in Europe must be willing to admit that Islam itself is the problem. Until then, they will be tilting at windmills and missing entirely the real culprit. Muslims desperately need to be freed from Islam. This naivete was not even dispelled by the November 2005 Muslim riots in France. Only after 12 nights of uncontrolled anarchy and destruction that had spread to 300 towns did French President Jacques Chirac finally declare a state of emergency leading to curfews. Thousands of vehicles had been burned and property damage was the worst since World War II. Yet, the riots were explained by many commentators as resulting from poverty, unemployment, and lack of social programs in the Muslim enclaves in Paris and other cities. In fact, the major cause was France's decades-old failure to face the truth about Islam, a grave mistake being repeated throughout Europe. Undeniably, the rioters were young men from North Africa, including many French-born from Muslim parents, estranged from the broader community. For half a decade, French Arabs have been carrying on a low-level intifada against synagogues, kosher butchers, Jewish schools, and so on. France's Arab Street correctly identified Chirac's opposition to the Iraq War as a sign of weakness. Firefighters and ambulance drivers have long been afraid to enter many Muslim areas without police escort. Even before the riots, 30 or more cars would be set ablaze on a quiet night and more than 9,000 police cars had been stoned already in 2005. Muslims' refusal to be assimilated into the community around them causes their lack of qualification for jobs. They attempt to create, eventually, a Muslim state, as Islam requires. Until each Western country demands that immigrants conform to its national rules, the situation, not only in France but elsewhere, will only become worse. Ernest Renan once praised Islam. Now, he declares, Muslims are the first victims of Islam— to liberate the Muslim from his religion is the best service that one can render him. The words of Sergei Trifkovich may sound harsh, but they are the truth. And the sooner the West faces that uncomfortable reality, the better. Quote, Islam is a collective psychosis seeking to become global, and any attempt to compromise with such madness is to become part of the madness oneself. No one who believes that jihad is the right or duty of all Muslims or who promotes adoption of Sharia law or reestablishment of the caliphate should be allowed to settle in any Western country. And every applicant should be asked. The passport of anyone preaching jihad should be revoked. This may be called discrimination, but the quarrel is not of our choosing. Islam, in Muhammad's text and its codification, discriminates against us. It is extremely offensive. Those who submit to that faith must solve the problem they set themselves. Islam discriminates against all unbelievers. Until the petrodollars support a Quranic revisionism that does not, we should go for it with whips and scorpions, hammer and tongs. Secularists and believers of all other faiths must act together before it is too late. End quote. We need a series of international debates to expose Islam to the world for what it really is. Muslims themselves, especially those being recruited for paradise operations, must understand that terrorism exposes Islam's moral bankruptcy. The fact that it takes terrorism and murder to maintain it proves that Islam has no appeal to truth 
honesty, and love from the heart. Incredibly, yet predictably, the vital words the French steadfastly refused to use in describing the November 2005 riots were Islam, Muslim, and terrorism. The true God pleads, Come now and let us reason together. Allah demands submission without any reason except that to refuse means death. The fact that Muslims have always had to use the threat of death to enlist and keep converts proves that Islam has nothing to offer to the person of goodwill. As Netanyahu has well said, it is the terrorists who are in fact weak, resorting to bombs only because they can get no one to listen to them in any other fashion. The determination of the terrorists to take the world for Allah and Islam must be opposed with even greater determination to protect the freedoms we hold dear, and which every conscience knows have been bequeathed to mankind by the true God who created us all. As anti-terrorist expert Jean Guiduc writes, to an American that sleeps safely and securely in its beds, giving no thought to the world in which we exist or the horrors that other nations face, confident in the belief that it can't happen here, much has occurred which should be setting off alarm bells for all of us. Indeed, those bells have been sounding for some time. We just haven't heard them. Yet. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to thebereancall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Don't none go with me. I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back.